Hello, travelers. Welcome back to Show and Tell with Reach the World. For over 20 years, Reach the World has used virtual exchange to inspire youth to become curious, confident global citizens. My name is Tim and as part of Reach the World's efforts to support educators and families during the COVID-19 pandemic, we are sharing free live stream show and tell events with members of our global community. You can find an updated calendar of live stream events and much more at athome.reachtheworld.org. For today's show and tell, I'm excited to welcome both explorer and scientist Sonia Richmond and wildlife photographer Sean Morton. Sonia and Sean are about one year into a 15,000 mile hike across all of Canada. They're following Canada's great trail and along the way they're focusing on wildlife and how youth can connect with nature and practice citizen science. I'm very excited to learn a lot more and I'm gonna turn things over to them shortly. But first to all of our live stream viewers today, welcome. We're so glad you're here. You can use the chat bar on the right hand side of your screen to share any questions you have for Sonia and Sean. Just drop them right into the chat bar and we'll be sure to incorporate them and, and pass them along after they're done with their presentation. We'll get to as many questions as we can in the next 30 minutes. And without any further delay, welcome to Show and Tell, Sonia and Sean. All Thank right. you. Thank you very much. I think we have some slides to share. So we'll just start sharing our screen with you and we'll jump right into the presentation. Sounds good. Okay, well, hello everyone and thank you for listening in today. My name is Sean Morton. And of course, I'm joined with Sonia Richmond, who is the brains behind most of our trek. Until recently, we lived near Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And Sonia worked at Bird Studies Canada, or Birds Canada, and I worked as a landscape photographer. Over the past year, we've sold our house, put our careers on hold, and donated most of our possessions to a four-year, 24,000-kilometer, or 15,000-mile, hike across Canada on the Great Trail. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Great Trail, which is also known as the Trans-Canada Trail, don't worry, you're not alone. A lot of people aren't aware of it, even here in Canada. It's 24,000 kilometers, as I said, or 15,000 miles long, and it's the longest recreational footpath in the world. It stretches all the way from Cape Spear, Newfoundland on the Atlantic coast, which is at the easternmost point of North America, to Victoria, British Columbia on the west on the Pacific coast, to Tuktoyaktuk, Northwest Territories on the Arctic Ocean. The trail is so long that if you reached it out end to end, it would go two thirds of the way around the earth. And it's equal, walking it is equal to going back and forth across America more than five times. In fact, it's so long that fewer people have undertaken this on foot than have actually gone to the moon. Canada is the second largest country in the world in area, but most of its population lives in the southern part, which means that most of the country and most of the population of the country lives along the east and west corridor of the Great Trail. As such, the Great Trail is available to 80% of Canadians within about 30 minutes of it. Now you might be wondering why we chose to do such a long hike across Canada. Well, we both love being outside more than we like sitting at a desk all day. We both love birds and wildlife and we're passionate about helping protect nature. So we wanted to have an adventure, but we also wanted to share the amazing places and landscapes and wildlife that we found along the way with others. And this is because we'd like to inspire people of all ages, cultural backgrounds, abilities, orientations, and identities to get outside, explore, and discover nature for themselves. So being a scientist, adventurer, or explorer when you're an adult is a lot of fun. But when you're young, it can sometimes be difficult to know where to start or how to get onto that career path. So today we're gonna to show you one way that you can begin adventuring and exploring, and that is by looking learning about nature through birds and be by becoming a citizen scientist. So we will begin by telling you about our own hike. Okay, so I imagine you're curious to know what it's been like for us so far. Well, we started hiking last June and we trekked for about 165 days until it just got about too cold for us to keep hiking. In that time, we covered about 3,300 kilometers or just over 2,000 miles crossing from Cape Spear, Newfoundland along to Riviere de Lou Quebec, which sits on the edge of the St. Lawrence Seaway. During the day, we would usually hike for six or seven hours, and at night we camp, 
which means we have our sleeping bags, we sleep in a tent, and we cook all our food on the camp stove. We carry everything we need inside our backpacks. And so this means we carry our clothes, our sleeping bags, our tent, pots, cooking stove, water filter, and of course our food. And that means sometimes our backpacks are actually pretty heavy. Carrying a heavy backpack might not sound like fun to a lot of people, but we've seen some truly amazing things on the way, including some really cool wildlife and of course lots of birds. Canada and its natural spaces are amazing and we're very lucky to be able to enjoy such outdoor activities. Along the way, as I said, we've seen and experienced some amazing things. We've been the first to see the sunrise in North America. We've scaled cliffs on rope ladders. We've walked on coastal footpaths. We've seen icebergs and puffins and spent the evenings on the sides of crystal clear lakes. We've gone days in remote wilderness without meeting anyone. We've seen caribou, moose, and black bear and over 150 species of birds just in our first year alone. We visit amazing national parks. We've explored amazing community reserves and wild spaces. We've sat in ancient cathedrals and we've learned about Acadian and East Coast culture. We've forded ice cold rivers and we've wandered in the Atlantic Ocean at one point as well. We've walked on the ocean floor with goats. We slept one night in a haunted jail cell. We've been actors in local plays with Parks Canada. We've trekked through snow blizzards, sheltered from tropical storms, survived a hurricane, and recently, like many of you, we've quarantined from a global pandemic. We've hiked on days in which it was minus 20 and days in which it was plus 45, often in the same week. And along the way, we've experienced overwhelming generosity, random acts of kindness, and countless words of encouragement for being explorers. We began hiking in Newfoundland, and the trail took us through part of the boreal forest, which is far away from most towns and cities. And you can see what it looks like generally across Newfoundland and the images on your screen. Here, there are lots of conifer trees, small lakes and rivers, marshes and bogs, but all of it is amazing, peaceful, and really, really beautiful. The boreal ecosystem covers about 60% of Canada's area, and it stretches right across the northern part of North America from Newfoundland to British Columbia. It's an incredibly important ecosystem because many of North America's rivers begin in the boreal forest, and it provides all of us with clean air and clean water, so it's essential. It's also known as North America's bird nursery because there's more than 300 species of birds which are there, and it, and it has between three and five billion baby birds born there every year. So in fact, many of the birds, if you're in North America, that you see in your own backyards, rely heavily on the boreal forest. So many of the birds that we, saw, that we see in our own backyards and parks across North America are migratory which means that they fly north in the spring to breed, and then they return to the southern US or Central and South America for the winter months. So one group of migratory birds that we saw a lot of as we crossed Newfoundland were these brightly colored warblers. You can tell a lot about a bird by its size and shape. So many of the warblers have very small feet for perching and hopping around on the branches of trees and bushes, and they have small beaks for catching insects that live among the leaves of trees. During spring and summer, there are tons of insects in the boreal for the warblers to eat. But during the winter, it's cold, like it's too cold for bugs to be out. So the warblers have to fly south in search of food and warmth. So we saw all of the migratory warblers shown here on the East Coast. But if you go outside into your backyard or visit a local park right now, it's possible if you're in North America that you might find any one of these species as they pass through your area on the way to the boreal. One of the amazing things about migratory species is how they connect a continent as large as North America. So if you think about it, the same birds that kids in Newfoundland on the east coast of Canada can see are some of the same species that you might be able to see in your own area as well. When we left Newfoundland and hiked across Nova Scotia, we left the boreal forest behind and we took the trail along the, into the famous Cape Breton Highlands National Park and past the home of Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone. And along the way, we trekked down the Celtic shoreline of Cape Breton Island. Along uh, as well, we also found active fishing harbors, pristine beaches, exhilarating views of the Atlantic Ocean, and a lot of amazing museums. One of our favorite parts was hiking around the Bay of Fundy. The Bay of Fundy has 16 meter tides, which are the highest in the world. And although the bay is huge, it's a relatively shallow area. So when the tide is out, it exposes huge mud flats. If you've ever visited a beach, you might have noticed that some of the shrimp and crabs and other microinvertebrates, which are small creatures that live in the mud, are, live in the area around the high tide mark. Well, the same thing happens, of course, in the Bay of Fundy. 
when the tide is out, the exposed mud flats in the Bay of Fundy are full of these high energy critters, which provide food for shorebirds, especially when they're migrating, like right now in the spring. So as we hiked around the Bay of Fundy, we saw lots of different kinds of shorebirds, like the ones shown right now on the screen. So as you can see, shorebirds tend to have long legs and toes, which are specially adapted to help them walk on wet sand. And they also have long beaks, which help them dig for food along the mud flats, shorelines, and rocky beaches. Some shorebirds breed way up north in the Arctic Circle and then fly thousands of kilometers to South America for the winter. Others are widespread and breed right across North America. So the next time you visit a beach, keep your eyes open and see if you can spot any shorebirds. When we left Nova Scotia, we hiked across Prince Edward Island, which is Canada's smallest province. We hiked it on the Confederation Trail. In PEI, we got to walk along the beautiful red sand beaches, as well as through forests and wetlands. A lot of the island is covered in rolling country, aside and agricultural land, and many of you might know that it's known for its potatoes. One group of migratory birds we saw in a lot of these open landscapes were hawks. So many hawks and birds of prey have very sharp bills and talons because they catch and eat small mammals or other birds. So they find food by soaring high above fields and other open areas and visually scanning for food below. During the winter, a lot of these small mammals hibernate or others might move around beneath the snow where it's hard for birds of prey to see them. So hawks tend to fly south in the winter as well, where it's easier to find food. Other birds of prey, like bald eagles, feed mostly on fish, which is why it's important for us to keep our rivers, streams, and shorelines clean. So wherever you are, if you look up into the sky and you see a bird soaring high up in circles, it's quite possible it could be an eagle or one of these migratory hawks. The next province we visited, and the last we'll talk about today, was New Brunswick. And if there's one word to describe the Great Trail in New Brunswick, it's diverse. The trail took us from the base of the Confederation Bridge, joining New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island at Cape German, around the Bay of Fundy through a pristine coastal wilderness on the famous Fundy footpath. Afterward, we followed roads through rolling forested hills and spent days hiking along the beautiful St. John River. We hiked along the St. John River in the fall, which gave us a chance to see lots of different migratory birds. So I'm sure that most of you would recognize the webbed feet that ducks have for helping them swim and dive and the broad flat beaks that they have for scooping up aquatic vegetation, fish and small macro invertebrates that live underwater. In areas where the ponds, lakes and rivers freeze over in the winter, ducks aren't able to swim and find food. So they also migrate south. Some ducks fly down and spend the winter in parts of the US while others fly even farther south. So next time you're visiting the ocean or a lake, or even if you go to the park in the city, take a few minutes and see how many different ducks you can spot. So we've shown you some of the different kinds of birds that we've seen as we hiked across the Eastern part of Canada. And many of them are ones that you might be able to see in your own neighborhoods. So as you can imagine, birds that fly thousands of miles each year face some serious challenges along the way as do the birds that stay in the same area all year round. So habitat loss from expanding cities, pollution from insecticides, unregulated hunting and trapping, and climate change are just a few of the challenges facing birds. Now, of course, some groups of birds are adapting to our changing world and doing very well, like waterfowl and birds of prey, while others, like shorebirds, are not doing so well, and they need our help. So that's where we come into all of this. Each one of us has an opportunity to help. But the question then is, where do you begin? Well, the first step is simply to learn your birds. So start by looking to see what birds visit your own backyard or local park. If you don't already know who regularly comes to visit, start by learning the names and habits of those birds. Figure out things like, what do they look like? What time of year do they visit? What types of food do they like? What do they sound like? If there are some that look really similar, are there any markings or features you can see that you can use to tell them apart? Perhaps some are red or orange or yellow. Others might have stripes on their wings or spots on their tummies. Once we begin to notice some of these things, that is how we begin to learn the what birds we have in our own backyards. Now there's over 10,000 species of birds in the world and over 2000 of them live here in North America. So learning your birds might seem like it would be really hard, 
But the good news is there are a couple of free apps that you can download onto your phone that make learning your birds simple and a lot of fun. So one of the apps that we most often use and recommend to others is called iNaturalist, and it's freely available for anyone with a mobile device to download and use. The kids version of iNaturalist, which is called Seek, is especially fun. So Seek is great because it's really simple to use. You simply open the app and use the camera on your device to take a photo of something in nature. So as you take the photo, the app will help you identify what you're taking a picture of and it will provide information about what that thing is. The other great thing about Seek is that it works for more than just birds. So if you're interested in butterflies or other insects, bats, reptiles, mammals, trees, wildflowers, whatever you like, this app can help you identify what you're looking at and help you learn about it. In addition, the app also keeps track of your observations. So you can start to build a list of all the species you've seen and where you saw them. You'll also be invited to enter different challenges. So as you build up your collection of species, you'll begin to earn badges for different achievements. So in some ways, learning to identify birds and other things in the natural world using Seek is a lot like playing a video game. You get to travel around collecting things, you complete various challenges, you can compete with your friends if you want to, and you can earn achievements as you build up your collection. But in addition to being a lot of fun, if you use Seek, you will also be helping birds and other wildlife by becoming a citizen scientist. So the photos you take and upload using iNaturalist and Seek are collected by scientists and turned into data to help them monitor our wildlife populations and understand which ones are doing well and which ones need our help. The really nice thing about learning about birds and becoming a citizen scientist is that the data you collect and submit helps birds not just in your own backyard and your own neighborhood, but across all of North America. Because birds migrate, many of the birds you see in your own backyard and help locally also rely on habitats in other areas. So this means that anything you do to help birds in your area will have a positive impact in many other places as well. Now, of course, we haven't just seen birds on our trek. Along the way, we've been fortunate to see caribou, beautiful deer, foxes, this rare pine marten in the middle of your screen, and we were visited by these two bears one morning outside our campsite. Along the way, we've also learned about trees and plants and other animals as we've hiked, which means, as Sonia said, that you can use citizen science to learn about more than birds. Really, whatever you're interested in the natural world, you can figure out through citizen science. In fact, with iNaturalist, it's also possible for you to submit observations about anything in the natural world that you're interested in. So another cool thing about starting to learn about birds and other wildlife is that becoming a citizen scientist makes you an explorer. Some people might think that you have to travel to far off places to discover new things and to be an explorer, but that's not necessarily true. You can explore nature in your own backyard in your schoolyard or in a local park. You don't need to travel to faraway places. You don't have to be great at sports and you don't need lots of money or expensive equipment. No matter who you are, what you look like, who you like or what language you speak at home, you can be a citizen scientist, an adventurer, and of course, an explorer. All you need is simple curiosity. So we encourage you to get outdoors and begin exploring your backyards and your community parks to see what you can find and what you can learn out there. So with that, thank you for taking time to listen to our talk and of course be part of our journey by listening to it. We'll end by telling you that we're on the Great Trail right now and we are currently hiking across Ontario, one of Canada's biggest provinces, and we'd like to invite you to follow along as we trek. We write a blog every day, we update Facebook every day, and of course we post images on Instagram every day. So if you're interested in learning about more about Canada, its geography, its diverse cultures, its history, and yes, of course, its birds, then this might be the thing for you. We're out here for the next three years, hopefully, and hopefully we'll have a great time together. Thank you for listening in once again, and we'll do our best to answer any questions any of you might have now. Sonia and Sean, that's fantastic and fascinating. And there's so many questions I have that I want to ask you as a result of every part of what you said. Um, there's a lot of interest amongst our online audience and some of the, um, why don't we just start with the logistics of your hike? Because it's such a 
gigantic undertaking. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, questions around what happens if there's bad weather? How do you get your food? Um, those kind of um, like the nitty gritty questions of, of what it takes to go on such a monumental hike um, over such a long period of time. Well, I think with bad weather, you just have to walk through it. And we've been really, really fortunate. Oftentimes when we've had a bad rain day, we have a warm day that the next day and everything dries out. Uh, when we've dealt with hurricanes and things, I mean, you've got to be smart. You have to realize that this is a bit too much for you to handle and you get inside. And we've been fortunate to have a lot of people help us with that along the way. In terms of food, the Great Trail often goes through a lot of small communities. And so we're able to stop in at grocery stores or we're able to mail supplies forward to ourselves. But it, it is a challenge. That's a good question. So part of it is good planning. So if you <laughs> want to do a really long trip like this, or even if you're just going for a week or something like that, you want to try and know where you're going to be beforehand. So when we're going through a town, we'll, lo we'll look to see where is our next supply point and make sure that when we leave that town, we have enough food to get us to the next place where we can buy food or pick it up from a supply drop or something like that. So part of this is all about planning mm -hmm. as well and being prepared. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine there are sections of trail that are really don't go near towns for a while and you need to know that um, ahead of time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you use any sort of uh, navigation aid? Do you follow a map? Do you use GPS? How do you know you're headed the right direction? We use a combination of things. And actually for the first time, a couple of days ago, we got lost. <laughs> but, um, so usually we, we started out by going to the Great Trail website. So they have a pretty good website of the whole trail. Um, and you can kind of zoom in on different sections. And if you click on them, you can get information about um, the particular trail you're on. So the Great Trail is a network of different trails. So you start by figuring out which trail you're on in each part of it and getting information about that. So we use that a, a fair bit. Um, last year, there was an app that went with that. So as we were hiking, we could kind of use the app on our phone to see where we were in relation to the trail and measure distance and stuff like that. Unfortunately, the app is down now. So we are using a combination of offline maps. We do have a GPS unit um, that also functions as an SOS. So it's a a Garmin inReach Explorer. So if we get into really serious trouble or we get hurt or something like that and we need medical assistance, we can use that device, not just for navigating, but also for communicating and um, calling for help. So that's part of our preparation side of things. Um, we've also essentially Google walked the trail. Um, my father helped out with this a lot and Sean have essentially gone through and Google walked the trail to see what amenities are where. So we know a little bit of what to expect along the way. So it's really a, a combination of different, different methods we're using to navigate. Okay, how interesting. And looping in another question from our online audience, do you see many other people on the trail or are you largely by yourselves as you're hiking? It varies from place to place. The trail is so varied that the experience changes from region to region. Um, out east, yes, we certainly met a lot of people. And this year, since we started in the nation's capital, Ottawa, Ontario, um, we met a lot of people because we were inside of a town. Uh, but that does vary. By the end of this year, we'll likely be in the prairie provinces in the Midwest, and there will be vast spaces in which we won't meet a lot of people. Okay, yeah, very interesting. Are there sections of the trail where you're anticipating seeing nobody for a really long time? I'm not sure. I guess in Northern Ontario, there may be a bit of a gap where we don't see people. And I think in the prairies, quite a bit of the trail is along the roadways. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll probably be passed by cars, but actually seeing other people out there, I don't imagine we'll see a lot of them, but I don't, we won't know till we get there. So much of this, we have no idea what it'll be like until we're out there. <laughs> All right, awesome. Well, let's switch into the, the wildlife aspect of your story because it's a favorite topic of, of all of our students, really and adults too, no matter what your age is. 
Uh, it's so fascinating to hear um, what you have seen and what you anticipate seeing and, and taking things at this pace gives you a chance to really slow down and, and see some of those things. Uh, your, your image that you showed of birds to identify got me immediately thinking like, wait a second, I've seen that one in, in my backyard. Maybe it was on its way through either to or from you know, Canada, uh, wherever it's going. Um, so, and I live in an urban center. So I hope all of our students who are following both the recording and the live stream, uh, go back and take a look at that slide if you didn't get a chance to look really closely because I think it's such a great message that, uh, that this, this wildlife goes to cities, it goes to uh, rural areas, it's all over the place. And I wonder, um, you shared some fantastic photos of, of the things that you've seen. Sean, are those all photos that you took? Generally, yes. <laughs> We've been really, really fortunate. And we found that once we step out or once anyone steps outside and starts to notice the nature around them, you'll be really amazed at what's out there. We, we are very much stuck on a four foot wide trail and that's what we have seen. So I think most people in their backyards and communities will see similar birds when they start to notice it. That's amazing. Has has any have you seen anything either of you that has surprised you or frightened you or um, just sort of took you caught you off guard um, in terms of wildlife encounters? I think waking up one morning and finding two black bears outside of our tent was a bit of a shock but you come very quickly to realize that most of nature doesn't want to hurt you. It doesn't, it's just curious or it's settled down to do its thing. And uh, once it notices you, it's definitely more terrified of us than we are of it. And it, it goes on its own way. So that was shocking that morning, but it was also incredible. Two massive creatures, just hearing them nuzzle in the grass and eat away and do their thing was really, was really amazing. Oh, very cool. Um, do you, you recommended some great apps that students can use to identify and nature in their own, wherever they live and join in this, this citizen science effort. Um, do you, um, when you use something like Seek, do you, can you just give us a walkthrough of what that actually looks like? So you have it on a phone or something and you spot something you're curious about and you uh, snap a picture of it? Yep, it's a, with Seek, it actually uses the camera. So you you open the app and you, there's just like a little icon for the camera and it's using the camera on the phone. And when you point your phone at say a bug or something like that, it'll, the app will actually be scanning. It'll be using an algorithm to kind of identify what you're pointing the camera at. And as it gets closer and closer, like it'll tell you what, gen, like what genus it's in and then like or the family, the genus, and then it gets down to species. And once it does that, you can just like push the camera button, you take a picture of it, and then you'll get all this information about what you just took a picture of. So you're really just using the camera on your phone to take a picture of something and it, it identifies it as you're doing that. That is, that is super cool and it works for plants as well? It does. Plants, animals, pretty much anything like wildlife tracks, rocks, tree bark, like almost anything you can find um, out in the natural world, it'll help you identify. And part of what's nice if you use the iNaturalist part is you're actually sharing it with other people in the iNaturalist community. So it's not just you making an identification, but you'll get confirmation of what you think it is from an expert in the iNaturalist community. So you're actually sharing with other people and sort of interacting. So it's a really nice sort of way to get into identifying stuff and learning about what's just in your environment. That's really cool. What a great way for students everywhere to, to get involved and, and take a closer look at some of the living things around mm -hmm. them. Uh, I wonder just as a, a big question, why is it important for students to uh, be interested in citizen science? Why is it something that that is worth their their time and energy to do during the summer, perhaps maybe when they have a chance to get out and take a closer look at, at the living things around them? Well, citizen science makes a huge contribution to conservation. Without, I mean, a, a handful of scientists wouldn't be able to monitor our wildlife populations in the area of one province or state let alone all of Canada or all of the US. 
or a continent. It's just impossible. We, and so many of our species are in trouble. They need our help. And we only have limited resources to try and help them out. So these observations from citizen scientists are like scientists are using these increasingly to, to help uh, monitor what's going on, to figure out where species are doing well, where they're not, which ones are doing well and where they're not. And they're using this to, to actually like implement conservation initiatives right across the, con the continent. And as you saw on the one of the slides, waterfowl and birds of prey are actually going up and they're doing well. And that's actually as a result of continent-wide conservation efforts that people have done. Preserving wetlands, preserving marshes, um, a lot of great work has been done. And the reason they knew where to put those efforts and you know what to do where was partially because of these citizen science, the data that's been submitted through citizen science. So it's enormously important um, mm. for conservation and for management of our wildlife population. All right, well, that's a fantastic message uh, for everybody who's listening. And uh, I hope that a lot of our students can spend their summer months investigating their, their natural habitats, whether they live in a city or a suburb or a rural area and see what they can discover using one of these apps and hopefully follow along with, with your journey as well. Um, I'd like to finish all of our, our show and tells with a question that I guess I'll have to modify for you guys because I know what your next adventure is gonna be. Uh, it's, it's gonna be an ongoing trek across Canada for the next couple of years, but do you have uh, an upcoming place that you are especially excited about hiking through? I think the Arctic Circle is really <laughs> exciting to me because I've never been there and it's so different. So few people get to see it. Um, I've never seen it, so I'm super excited to see what it's like. I think one of the things is we you, you think you know your neighborhoods and you think you know your province or your home state, but when you get out there walking and really looking around, you discover you don't know a whole heck of a lot about it. And so every day, even if it's regions we've been through, are exciting. We see things we didn't know would be there. We meet people and hear incredible stories. We have all these random acts of kindness that are really helpful. And the world is so much different when you engage with it in person, um, especially more than the news or what we see online. The world is a wonderful place. And there's a lot of nature in our own communities that can be engaged. And so each day is actually wonderful. Well, fantastic. I think that's a great message for us to finish on. Uh, I wanna thank our live stream audience today for the great questions. Um, Sean and Sonia, it's so great to hear about your expedition and the work you're doing. And thank you for looping in our students and empowering them to become citizen scientists and contribute on their own. This has been really, really fun to learn about. Um, I wanna invite our entire live stream audience to join us again next week. For any one of our live stream events is coming up and the following week we have Oceans Week. So there's a lot of fantastic learning still to go this school year. You can find a complete list of upcoming Reach the World events at athome.reachtheworld.org. And with that, I will say goodbye and thank you again, Sonia and Sean. Happy, happy trails. Thank you. <laughs>